So I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the final How Do I webinar for this semester. This one is How Do I Use Open Educational Resources. I'm Sam Eneman in the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I will be your host today. Uh, so before we go any further, though, could I ask everyone uh, in the, to use the chat and just uh, tell us what department you're in and where you are logging in from today, whether it's home, office, wherever it might be. And if you would use the chat, that would be great to do that. And uh, as we go along, uh, feel, please feel free to type any comments or questions you have into the chat. Um, if you have a question and you do want to use your microphone and, and ask it verbally, click the hand icon. Uh, but I will be monitoring the chat, so don't worry. Um, if you don't have a microphone or it's not working, you can always type questions into chat. Uh, if you have any technical problems, uh, and, and you're here on campus, of course, you can just dial the direct number 75500. If you're off campus, you need to dial the full number 704-687-5500. We are recording the session today, and I will be sending uh, the link to the playback uh, in the next couple of days. So I am very happy to um, introduce Judy Walker from Atkins Library. Uh, she's the education psychology librarian and also works closely with the Graduate Life Center and the English Language Training Institute. And I think Judy must have been one of the first people I met in the, uh, in the library. And she is a very savvy technological person and has, uh, and I'm really looking forward to her presentation today. So let's all please welcome Judy. All right. I hope everybody can hear me. You should all be seeing my website. Is that correct? Uh, give Sam a, a little check mark so I know people can see it. How are we doing? Everybody can see it. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, this is um, a, a LibGuide uh, or a research guide that uh, education folks or librarians make for class pages, but I decided to use this instead of a PowerPoint primarily because I want, I want you to have access and see, we're going to do a little hopefully live um, uh, wandering around on the web, but uh, first we're going to look primarily at the center part of this um, uh, page and that's going to act as my uh, PowerPoint uh, or basic information. And the first thing I want to start off with is what I am going to talk about today and what I'm not. I want to, before I even do that, this is the link to that page so if you want to write that down somewhere and then you can come back to this page at any time. And you would also be able to, if you were to click up on the, the video link, see the video that we were going to play as well as some other videos that uh, talk about open education resources and uh, so forth. So that's just a, a heads up for that. But what I'm not going to talk about is I'm not going to talk about open education education open education as the broader topic. We're not going to talk about open access. We're not going to talk about MOOCs and we're not going to talk about Creative Commons, although all of these um, issues or concepts are part of are related to educational uh, open educational resources. Um, what we will talk about is a little bit of why, uh, what some kind of a little bit of the research that's been done, also some of the characteristics of open uh, education resource pieces, um, things to ponder if you're going to use them or uh, working with them, and also then we'll kind of take a look at some of the sites to go to. We have a, a nice variety of folks. Um, I will, well, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so just so we're all on the same page. So if you thinking, if you were thinking we we're going to talk about MOOCs or anything like that, you might want to leave now. Um, but um, first of all, why? 
and uh, right now you know the provost and whenever you do a new course and so forth everybody says have you checked with the library or have you checked whether there's an electronic resource um, that can be used for your textbook and um, this is some of the recent research of 2014 actually it's uh, some of the other articles that are a little newer than this actually have the the um, the percentage a little bit higher that not 65 uh, percent of the students are not purchasing their um, uh, textbooks because of the high price and um, that has implications on their performance it also has probably implications on how um, uh, how many courses how many credits they're taking at a time also whether they persist uh, and so forth and so on and then um, this is also said the prices so we know um, you know the textbook prices have have been uh, go, you know increasing Oh, far beyond uh, regular inflation and um, the library itself is trying to help you with that uh, by providing you a, a database to look at uh, books that we do have electronically that you might be able to use in your classroom <clears throat> if you need more information about that we're not really going to look at that uh, here uh, just contact me and I can give you that information if you're not familiar with that program uh, but in general, the library is trying to help cut the cost of textbooks. And of course, the provost is also wanting us to try and, and limit uh, the cost of textbooks and, and additional materials for our classes uh, because a lot of students are, are being uh, asked to pay this extra money above the tuition and they could be using that money for other um, for other classes. In fact, there was a study done that indicated that um, there, oh, in one of the uh, surveys, I'm trying to look at the actual data so I give it to you correctly, the average cost of a commercial textbook across the courses that they were surve surveying was $140.85, which uh, represented a potential total cost to all of the folks involved in the uh, research that they were doing of $1,324,000. Seventeen dollars um, for that particular sample in the research. That's a million dollars. Uh, can you imagine what could be done if those students weren't didn't have to pay out that million dollars? That money could be going to another course. Uh, it could be going to uh, additional uh, support and so forth and so on. So, the high cost. That's one of the reasons why faculty should become more aware of the uh, open educational the possibilities of open educational resources. So. Uh, what is it? Uh, and and this is kind of a little bit of a um, uh, I don't want to say you uh, Hewlett uh, Foundation the Hewlett Foundation has come up with a definition which is fairly well supported across the uh, disciplines and so forth and that it's it's anything that's of high quality open license um, basically online materials that folks can use in their classroom. Uh, or in a course. It doesn't mean that the course is necessarily online. It doesn't mean uh, that everything, you know, it's a blended class. It could be just a textbook or it could be just videos uh, from another course, uh, somebody else's course that you could use in your classroom. The key pieces here, though, is that they're high quality and they're openly licensed. And that's where the uh, Creative Commons licensee comes in. Uh, and again, we're not necessarily going to talk about that here. That can be a whole other uh, uh, webinar on how do I use uh, Creative Commons uh, licensing and so forth to share and and how it, it, it applies to the resources that you're actually using now one of the interesting things um, that I found or the 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 open edge open education resources movement actually started overseas in Europe in Africa in the, the developing countries where they did not have uh, the resources to even buy any textbooks so uh, they partnered with different um, institutions in Europe and so forth to begin to create these kinds of shared uh, resources that can be shared globally so it's not uh, when we actually look at some of these materials and look at some of the places to find materials you're going to see that it's actually very international in scope um, and if you're looking at this you can actually click on the the link and go out to the uh, foundation and see more about what they've done mm -hmm. UNESCO is also another uh, 
group that uh, has been heavily invested in the uh, open open resources. Somebody, I think, has their mic on and is making a lot of noise into, so you might want to check to make sure your mic is muted unless you're talking. Okay, so the three character, five characteristics of it is that you could, these materials can be reused, they can be revised, they can be remixed, they can be redistributed, and they can be retained. Um, and again, they could be videos, they could be uh, PowerPoints, they could be simulations, they could be all kind, um, even co full courses, um, the MIT uh, full course uh, offerings, and so forth. So you as an instructor or a professor can use these materials. You can add to them. You can take out things that are not uh, pertinent to your particular curriculum, but there are other pieces are, then you can use those. So it's, it's kind of um, a, a grab bag of things. It's not you are given these, you can only use it the way it was originally intended. You can tweak it, I guess is the best way to put it, uh, and, and, and tailor it to your class. So you don't have to um, totally reinvent uh, a lot of the uh, uh, any kinds of videos and things that you might want to use in your classroom. Okay, so um, Oh, I should go back. Uh, let me go back a little bit and talk a little bit uh, again about um, some of the research that's been done before we go into some more of the pondering. Um, there's not been a lot of research, but the most current research um, in the last year and a half have discovered that students using uh, these materials in the classroom um, are certainly not, uh, how do I want to say, they're performing as well, if not better, than students uh, in the uh, control groups using a more traditional textbook and so forth. So all of the research has seemed to say that the materials aren't going to be detrimental to the student performance. Uh, the interesting thing that, I, I, uh, that they found is that if the students are paying less for textbooks, they can use that money or do use that money to enroll, let's say, in an, an extra class. So it ha does ha seem to have, at the moment, uh, this is just preliminary research, uh, an effect on um, time to graduation, uh, retention, uh, and I mean retention to the in the in the, the university uh, students are using these material that are using these materials find that they are as good as text if not better than text materials faculty also uh, that have been using it have, have found these materials um, have also found that the materials themselves are as good if not better than um, some of the textbooks that they've had to use and so forth so that's just giving you a little bit of the research now, <clears throat> thinking about this, okay, pondering what a couple of things you have to keep in mind. As I said, although both faculty and students seem to think that the, um, the open education resources are as good or better than uh, traditional textbooks, that's because, or I would say, that's because the faculty using those materials have chosen and found good uh, open education resources. Not all open education resources are created equal. There are some that you'll find and you'll run across that, that may be a couple of years old and they haven't been updated, even though that is probably one of the um, pluses of using open education resources, that they can be easily updated. Uh, but if somebody creates them uh, and then retires or leaves the institution, they may not get updated as, as, as nicely as they could. However, that doesn't mean, that doesn't preclude you from taking this older material and then updating it yourself. So that's the advantage of it. But um, some, uh, some folks don't have quite as much uh, support to create these, so they might look a little funky. But then again, you know what what the students are looking at on on Instagram and on their uh, devices can look pretty funky too. So uh, a real polished uh, video may not be as attractive to our students now as a funky looking one. Um, so that's just to give you uh, an idea that you do really need to uh, evaluate these uh, items. Now my concern, which is I haven't seen really addressed anywhere, um, is the digital divide. 
uh, our students, many of them are the uh, uh, first generation. They may not have the computer, uh, they may not have the capability, they may not have access to it, so you need to be very careful in making sure that uh, students are going to have the uh, capability to use the sources that you um, are going to provide for them. Uh, now at the library, you know, we, you know, any student can come in and, you know, if you're, they can watch all kinds of videos. We have all the kinds of uh, software and so forth. So they do have that access, but they may not have the access at home. So just keep that in mind. Another issue that does come up, oops, not that one, uh, with the digital divide, you'll come back to that in a second, um, is, is accessibility. Not all, um, not all of the resources are accessible. That means, uh, when I say accessible, not the digital divide kind of accessible, I mean accessible to those that are visually impaired or uh, are, uh, are uh, profoundly deaf or uh, physical uh, capability. So again, you have to be able to actually uh, really evaluate what you're looking at and making sure and if you have questions about accessibility the department the um, Department of um, uh, Disabilities can help you. Um, Cahill is really good at uh, being able to, to ferret out what's good and what's not good for uh, the uh, students um, that they work with. So having said all that the one piece here is that it is not, people say, oh, we got all this open ed education resources out there. It's not easy. It's not something that you can just say, oh, I can just use all this stuff. So you, it's, not, it's not a pass that you can go take a nap or not do your work. You're going to have to actually do some work as well. Um, and again, it's like any, any resources you're working with and so forth. The first couple of times, you know, when you first use it, it's going to take more of your effort. Um, but as you get, get used to using and finding the materials, it gets a lot easier. But I just thought, you know, this is not where you can go and snooze. Um, it's, it is work. Uh, it's, I always hate people, you know, the, um, the salesperson says, oh, it's really easy to use this, and you get in, and it's it's not nearly as easy as everybody tells you it is. So be aware of that. Okay, so finding resources. Um, that's the hard part. Um, that's really where you have to do some work ahead of time. Now, there are different kinds of places to go. Obviously, you can still go to YouTube, and you can go to uh, Vimeo. Uh, and in, in most cases, because it is uh, educational use, that would be um, uh, allowable under the copyright. Um, the, there are some issues on how many times you would use it and so forth. And when our new copyright person comes in, you can talk to her about that um, or him. Um, the, but there are some sites such as Merlot, um, uh, Teach Docs, uh, this is the National Science Digital Library. These are sites that are, have been created specifically for the idea of uh, distributing uh, open education resources. And most of these, or 99.9% .9 of these items, are going to have the um, Creative Commons capability or uh, license for you to reuse and remix and to, uh, to, to use uh, freely. Uh, so again, you can use YouTube and there's lots of things on YouTube that have Creative Commons um, and, Vimeo, and, and Vimeo that have Creative Commons uh, licensing a lot of the blog posts and so forth and so on, so depending upon what you're using there. Um, uh, the, the, this is the DPLA, is the Digital Public Library of America. Um, these are mainly, I put that in there a little bit, it's a little bit not quite educational resource, uh, open educational resources, but they are uh, primarily uh, primary sources from a variety of libraries from around the country or actually around the globe. Um, so it's a good place if you're in, in uh, wanting to look at primary sources from uh, all different kinds of backgrounds. So uh, somebody was here from sociology, this would be a good place to go to be looking for that anthropology, um, even political science. Uh, there's going to be a lot of material out there that you can use. And that, that is all open and um, uh, creative comments. The same with teach.com is actually uh, a, a, the Library of Congress. OK, so that gives you kind of little places ago. But what I have on this page, and we'll kind of take a look at, we've talked about Merlot 
where are we on time? Okay, I got about three minutes, four minutes. Um, uh, just to give you a, an idea of how a lot of these sites work, um, Merlot, and let's see, hurry up and wait. Um, <laughs> I love computers. Well, let's come back to. Uh, well, let's see if that li lines up. Um, Merlot, it, it's basically a, a catalog. You can use uh, different types of. Uh, uh, you can do by grade level. You can do by um, subject. You can do the kind of. Uh, what I wanted to show you there in particular was the kinds, different kinds of. Um, Oh, uh, resources. So it, it, you can find PowerPoints, or you can find simulations. You can find uh, different kinds of uh, materials. What I want to point out too, though, is over here on the open uh, open textbook collections. These are um, both the, uh, the University of Minnesota, and let's see if that one will come up. Ah, there we go. So you can go in and browse by subject. Now these are not you know, hundreds or thousands of items. Let's see, we did have some, let's go into humanities or social sciences. We had a couple of folks in there. Um, so you get to see these, a lot of these textbooks, I'm particularly interested in some of the uh, psychology, have been created for the curriculum at the University of Minnesota. Um, but they are now, well, uh, they or they align with the curriculum because this one is actually done by, uh, the University of Maryland. And so you can look at the textbook, see how it aligns with your particular curriculum, and then uh, adapt it from there. Uh, and that's true of any textbook, even a print textbook. You always adapted it to uh, what kinds of things that you, or the, um, you know, what you wanted to use. You weren't going to use the whole textbook. Um, so that's, uh, that's true of um, the British Columbia one as well. OpenStax is a little bit funky uh, in that it does have uh, open material for you. Uh, students can also then pay uh, maybe five, ten dollars for if they want actually want to print because there are some students that still want their print. Um, the Sayer, yes, that's the, uh, uni the uh, online um, uh, university, uh, does have a number of, uh, of, of textbooks available as well. Uh, Book Boom is another one. Uh, they're one of uh, open textbooks from SUNY is the same idea. Open Textbook Library is actually from, I want to say Stanford, but it's one of the other universities. So you can take a look at some of those. Um, you can also um, look at the open course materials down here. Um, I should point out uh, a number of you uh, are familiar with lynda.com and there are a lot of really good uh, materials in there. Your students, uh, if they are, certainly if they're a Mecklenburg County student, the public library, uh, their public library card will give them access to all of the, the lynda.com uh, uh, tutorials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can actually incorporate some of those into your classroom. If they're not um, from uh, Mecklenburg County, but they're residing here, they should be able to get a a, a, a card at the public library, which is just up the corner here. Um, and if they're not, if they're one of the surroundings, they can check with their library, and they probably also have uh, the Lynda.com. That seems to be very uh, popular with the public libraries. Um, I see that I am now up because uh, uh, I'm at uh, 1255 and I was told that's how long I had. So I guess if there are any questions, um, there I will point out over here, I don't like to recreate the wheel. These two librarians have done an excellent job uh, of e finding even more sources and places to look for um, uh, open education resources. I should point out that we're in... Uh, the library is uh, talking about uh, an institutional repository, uh, which could very well also support um, locally created open access um, resources for sharing among our faculty, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's, that's still in discussion and with uh, folks on campus, so that might be coming down the um, 
oh, one more. I should. I got to point this one out. This is actually uh, North Carolina. Actually, has their own learning object uh, repository. Um, a lot of it's from Duke and from Chapel Hill and from uh, some of the community colleges. And um, so you can go and look at a lot of the materials in there, and that's all freely available. Questions? Okay, great. Thank you, Judy. That was terrific. So, uh, does anyone have any questions for Judy before we uh, wrap this up today? I should point out that my con my contact information is at the bottom of that that page. I didn't put it up top where it normally is because I don't like looking at myself. Well, so you know where to go, who to talk to in the library if you have questions about open educational resources. Judy Walker, you can find her in the directory. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Uh, it's about lunchtime, so uh, <laughs> before we wrap up, I will offer everyone a virtual dessert. Mm -hmm. So please feel free to uh, use have the one of your choice. My favorite there is the uh, fudged out, for sure. Um, and uh, this is the final uh, webinar in our How Do I series for this year. We'll be picking these up again in the fall. So when you get your, uh, your uh, survey, or your evaluation for this session, uh, please, if there are any topics that you would like us to, to talk about in these How do, How do I webinars, or really any of our webinars or workshops, please add those. Uh, we do check those, and that's how we develop uh, uh, ideas for new workshops and new webinars. So again, thank you all for attending. Hope you have a great wrap-up of the semester, and we'll see you again in the fall for this series of How Do I webinars. Thanks. <laughs>